thank you everyone for coming and joining. I want to go ahead and give you a disclaimer that I am not a master gardener, but I did major in horticulture at NC State. So here we go. I'm going to go over the schedule here really quick. I'm going to talk about some characteristics of the Piedmont, what are some challenges of gardening in the Piedmont. Then I put together a little snippet of plants that are good for planting in the Piedmont. Uh, then I'll go over a few ways that we can garden without plants and still provide habitat for wildlife. Then we'll go over some garden examples, some advice, and then we'll have time for some questions at the end of the presentation. Okay, so Living here in the Piedmont, we are in a hardiness zone of 8A to 7A. Uh, that just means that we're going to reach average minimum temperatures between 0 degrees Fahrenheit and 15 degrees Fahrenheit. So we want to make sure to plant plants that can withstand down to those temperatures. Uh, we also have a clay soil. This red clay soil is very characteristic of North Carolina and it can present several challenges. Clay is a challenge and we also have some really um, hot summers. So we want to make sure that we can plant plants that can withstand periods of drought or just withstand that heat. And so that presents a question of what plants are good for clay soil. Uh, we want to make sure that we make the clay manageable and that can often, it's often important and necessary to add compost to our clay soils in order to make them easier to dig in, easier to plant. So we have um, compost adding to our clay soil that will just make it better for annuals and perennials. Trees and shrubs have a pretty vigorous root system, so they might be better adapted for clay soils, but annuals and perennials may need a little bit of help by adding some compost. Start with some larger shade trees. Uh, we have the white oak tree here. This is a large deciduous tree. It can reach a height of 50 to 80 feet tall, and it's best planted in full sun. It is tolerant of our clay soils here, which is great, and it is a slow growing plant. So when you first plant it, it may be 10 to 15 feet tall, but you want to make sure that you place it in a good location because it can reach 50 to 80 feet tall. Uh, it has a ton of wildlife characteristics. It'll produce acorns annually. It attracts small mammals and butterflies and moths. It'll provide cover for birds and small mammals, and it's the host plant for the Edwards hair streak, which is this butterfly um, up top here. Um, Madison, it looks like we just have one quick question um, yeah. just to go back. Um, what Definitely. are the specific challenges of clay soil? So clay soil is very dense. It's very hard to, um, it'll cake very easily, making it very tough for root systems to dig through. They also like to hold on to lots of water and, and nutrients and not allow those to be accessible to plants. It can cause a lot of drainage issues as well, which compost will help increase drainage. It'll help make nutrients available to plants. So adding compost is really just a great way to um, make clay a better soil. Great, thanks. Yeah. Uh, so again, the tulip tree is, is one of my favorite trees. It's actually blooming now. I took that picture of the flower on Monday. Uh, it's a large deciduous tree and it can get very tall, reaching a height of 60 to 90 feet tall. It's best planted in full sun and it has these nice showy flowers in the spring. Unfortunately, it blooms after it's already leafed out, so it can be challenging to see these really pretty flowers. But that's what they look like. They're a great flower that it will attract native bees and hummingbirds. It's a favorite tree for nesting birds and it's the host plant to the eastern tiger swallowtail and the red spotted purple. Um, and the, you can see this leaf, it has four tiger swallowtail larvae on it, which is um, very telling. Black cherry is also a tree that was blooming last week. It might still be blooming this week, um, but it's a deciduous tree. It can reach a height of 50 to 80 feet tall. It likes full sun to part shade, and it produces those nice white cluster of flowers. Fruit is eaten by 33 different species of birds and mammals, making it a really good wildlife plant. Um, it's the host plant to several moths and butterflies, including the eastern tiger swallowtail, the cherry gall azure, and the viceroy. Uh, the viceroy is this butterfly here at the, on the right. It's a mimic of the monarch butterfly. But one way that you can tell them apart is that the viceroy has several black lines going down the hind wings and then one line going straight across horizontally on the hind wings, which the monarch doesn't have that. So that's one way to tell them apart. 
This is a passion flower vine. It's a perennial vine that can reach a height of six to eight feet tall. It likes full sun to part shade. It's a heat tolerant and clay tolerant plant, so it's perfect for the Piedmont. Um, and that actually does produce an edible fruit. I've never personally had it, but I've heard that um, it's pretty good. Fruit will attract birds. The flowers will attract bees and butterflies. It's a host plant to the Gulf fritillary butterfly, which is this yellow or orange butterfly up top, and then the red banded hair streak, which it's pictured here sitting on a milkweed, but this is the red banded hair streak here. Virginia creeper is a deciduous perennial vine. It can reach a height of 30 feet to 50 feet, and it's like, it likes full sun to part shade. I think that this is a really good plant that could replace uh, English ivy, which is very damaging to buildings and trees. It's a very aggressive plant and it's non-native, um, but this plant is native and it adheres with adhesive discs, which means that it's not going to damage your buildings. I think that this would be good for like a cottage garden as it can grow up like a back shed or a trellis or an arbor. Um, but it is unfortunately often confused with poison ivy. So I have them here side by side for comparison. Poison ivy here, you can see it has three leaflets with a red dot in the center, whereas Virginia creeper has five leaflets and no red dot. This is going to provide a lot of wildlife characteristics. It produces this nice blue berry that will attract songbirds. If it's growing up a tree, it could provide perches for birds, or you can also grow it as a ground cover, which can provide cover for chipmunks and squirrels. It's also the larval host plant for several sphinx moths. Here we have the uh, interrupted fern. It's an evergreen perennial fern. It can reach a height of two to three feet tall. It likes part shade to full shade, and it can tolerate wet or dry soil. So it's a very versatile plant. Um, it looks gorgeous when planted in mass, like seen in this picture. Um, when it's planted in mass like this, it can provide cover to small mammals and amphibians. And it's also the host plant for the Osmunda moth. Here we have switchgrass. This is one of my favorite grasses. It's a perennial grass reaching a height of three to six feet tall. It's got this nice dense foliage, making it really good for a prairie garden or even like a screen if you want to. I've seen it used to block like generators on NC State's campus. So it's got that nice tall dense foliage. It can reach a height of three to six feet tall. It likes full sun to part shade and it blooms in the fall. And it grows in these nice dense clumps. You can see here's a clump here and then another one here. Um, but the seeds are eaten by ground birds and by game birds. It's used for cover for nesting and it provides nesting material as well. It attracts birds and butterflies and it's a host plant to several different banded skippers and satyrs. Uh, here's a little blue stem. This is a pretty uh, commonly known grass. It's a perennial grass reaching a height of two to four feet tall. It likes full sun, it's drought tolerant, and it does need some nice well-draining soils. Uh, if you have really dense clay and it's not draining very well, this is a good example of when you should add some compost. That'll help with drainage and it'll help the root systems of the grasses go deeper. This is a good plant for like a perennial bed or a prairie garden. Uh, it has that really nice blue foliage. It's used for nesting material by birds and native bees. Mammals are eating the seeds and birds will also eat the seeds as well. And it's a host plant for several species of skippers. Uh, here we have Indian grass. This is another tall perennial grass, really good for a prairie garden. It reaches a height of three to eight feet tall, likes full sun, and it has these nice rust color blooms in the fall, which are pictured really nicely here in this bottom left picture. Um, and it is also drought, uh, drought tolerant. Uh, the seeds are eaten by birds and mammals. It's really good nesting material for birds and native bees, and it attracts butterflies. It's the larval host plant for the salt and pepper skipper, which is this cute little skipper up top. Um, we just have one question, Madison. What is a skipper? A skipper is a small butterfly. This is, um, the salt and pepper skipper pictured here is a good example of what the wing structure of a skipper is like. That's the most identifying feature for a skipper butterfly. Great. Uh, this is Solomon's seal. This is a herbaceous perennial, reaches a height of one to three feet tall. 
Um, it likes part shade to full shade and it emerges in early spring. It blooms in late spring, early summer. This is a good understory plant at the J.C. Ralston Arboretum. This is planted under some uh, live oak trees and it makes a really beautiful, stunning understory plant. Uh, the roots are browsed by small mammals. Birds will eat the fruit. The butterflies are attracted to those pendulate flowers and it provides covers for smaller wildlife. Uh, here we have Eastern Blue Phlox. This is actually blooming now as well. This is an evergreen herbaceous perennial and it's a very low growing per perennial reaching a height of zero to one feet tall. It's good in part shade to full shade and it likes moist soils. So this would be good for like a wetland garden or a woodland garden, places where you wanna really naturalize an area. It's a good nectar source in the spring and then the flowers will attract hummingbirds, bees and butterflies. And the roots can also be uh, sometimes browsed by rabbits as well. Here we have the cardinal flower. This is a herbaceous perennial reaching a height of two to four feet tall. It likes full sun to part shade and has these beautiful uh, showy red flowers. It's good in a rain garden or a wetland garden. It's a nectar source in late summer and it'll attract bees and butterflies. And it's actually um, commonly pollinated by hummingbirds, specifically the ruby-throated hummingbird, which is this gorgeous hummingbird here on the left. This is actually the only breeding hummingbird in North Carolina, which is uh, super interesting. I saw some just last week um, and earlier this week, so they're back in North Carolina, so keep an eye out for those. Here we have beard tongue pinstemon, which is a herbaceous perennial. It reaches a height of three to five feet tall. It likes full sun. It blooms in the late spring, and it's a very versatile plant, so it will do well in several different garden scenarios, uh, whether you have moist soil or dry soil, it'll do pretty well. Um, it attracts hummingbirds and bees. It's a special value to native bees who maybe specialize on pollinating this flower. And it's a larval host plant for several butterflies, including the common buckeye, which is this butterfly up top, and then the Baltimore checker spot. Here we have ironweed, which is a herbaceous perennial. It reaches a height of four to six feet tall. It likes full sun, it blooms in the late summer, and it's typically planted in rain gardens. It has that nice tall branching flowers that will attract bees and butterflies. In the fall, it produces seeds that are eaten by songbirds. And it's the larval host plant for the American lady butterfly, which is this butterfly down on the bottom. Bowpie weed is a really good pollinator plant. It's a very tall herbaceous perennial. It can reach a height of five to seven feet tall. It likes full sun to part shade and it adds height to a garden bed because it does get so tall. It blooms in late summer, but once it does bloom, it just is a magnet for butterflies and bees. It's an incredible nectar source. The seeds are eaten by swamp sparrows and it's the larval host plant for the pearl crescent. Another really interesting fun fact about this plant is that it has pithy stems, which are perfect nesting sites for native bees who will often bore into the stems and create nests in there. So it's actually really good to provide habitat for bees like that as well. Uh, here we have the common milkweed, which is probably pretty well known by many of you. It's a herbaceous perennial reaching a height of two to four feet tall, though Tara and I have seen some that get pretty close to five to six feet tall as well. Um, it likes full sun and it blooms in the summer. It's the larval host plant for the monarch butterfly, which you can see it just hanging off here, sipping the nectar from the flowers. It's a nectar source for bees and butterflies and also a special nectar source for native bees who maybe pollinate it in a certain way. Here we have black-eyed Susan. It's a herbaceous perennial reaching a height of three to four feet tall. It likes full sun and it's drought tolerant. This is a picture I took last summer on a farm where they had a meadow garden. So you can just see how, how proliferous it is in its blooms. The ripened seeds will attract goldfinches and other songbirds in the fall. And it's a great nectar source for bees and butterflies as well. This is swamp sunflower. It's also a herbaceous perennial reaching a height of five to eight feet tall. 
So it does get really tall. It's probably best to plant them in the back of your garden or maybe in the center, adding height to those areas. It's a full sun to part shade plant and it blooms in the fall. It likes moist soil, so it's great for like a rain garden or a, a wetland garden where it's going to stay moist for a while. The seeds will attract songbirds, grouse, and small mammals. And this is a picture of a grouse here on the bottom. It's a nectar source for a variety of bees and butterflies, including the, oh, well, it's actually the larval host plant for the silver, silvery checker spot butterfly, which is pictured up, up top. Here we have the late purple aster, which is a herbaceous perennial. It reaches a height of two to three feet tall. It blooms in full sun to part shade. It's a late fall blooming plant, which is great because it blooms later than other asters and it'll provide nectar and pollen for those late flying bees and butterflies. Um, it does also need well draining soil, so maybe adding some compost if you have really dense clay. Songbirds will eat the seeds in the fall and it's the host plant to the pearl crescent. And the pearl crescent flies for a very long time in the summer, so you'll frequently see this butterfly. Uh, wrinkle leaf goldenrod is a great plant to plant in conjunction with the late purple aster because they're both fall blooming plants and they're going to provide that late nectar and pollen that migrating monarchs need and other late flying pollinators need. It's a herbaceous perennial reaching a height of three to four feet tall. It likes full sun and it blooms in the fall. It'll attract bees, butterflies, beetles, anything that's flying still and needs some resources before winter hits. Seeds will attract goldfinches, indigo bunting, and sparrows. And it's uh, also the host plant to several species of moths. Okay, so that's all the plants I have for you, but I wanted to go ahead and talk about how we can provide for wildlife without plants. Uh, our hot summers and our clay soils can provide a lot of challenges that can make it hard to garden sometimes. So uh, this just, helps us become more creative in being a wildlife steward. Uh, the best way to provide habitat are to include things that are food, include water, cover, places to raise young, or to use sustainable practices. So I wanted to talk about a few different ways that we can do that to include wildlife habitat, but just not quite have uh, the plants there. One way to do that is to have bare soil for ground nesting bees. Ground nesting bees make up 70% of our native bee population, uh, which is astounding for pollination purposes. So we want to make sure that we cater to their needs. What they like best is some like low growing, either low growing grass or sporadic grass. If you have an area where it's just really hard to have plants, I would suggest using river rock and using it so that it leaves these gaps. So we have um, these two examples of some good sites for ground nesting bees. Another piece of advice that I would have is to use leaves for mulch instead of wood mulch. Wood mulch is pretty heavy and so bees have a harder time moving it, but if you use leaves, it's a lighter material and they can dig down to the ground so they can still access it. Uh, another piece of advice I would have, if you have like a large perennial garden, um, it might be good to mulch the first few feet of the bed, the area that you see the most, and then leave the back part where you don't see the ground as much. Leave that part bare just to allow for those ground nesting bees to have their habitat. Um, another really important note on uh, sustainable practices is to maybe avoid using pesticide use in the late winter, early spring, when these native bees are likely going to be looking for nesting sites. Pesticides can just be harmful to the bees and you don't want to harm them when they're trying to nest and reproduce for the, for the year. Uh, another good thing to include that's not plants could be wood piles and bee hotels. Bee hotels are definitely becoming very popular. Here, the wood pile is a really good way to provide nesting sites for those solitary nesting bees. I personally would put it under something that's more covered, like uh, the bee hotel here has a nice cover on it. Bees like to have drier nesting sites, so that would be a good tip. It's also important to face them southeast so that they get morning sunlight rather than facing south where they would get more afternoon sun. 
afternoon sun could cause bees to overheat or they may simply just not choose that area to nest. So it's important to face them southeast. You can also see here inside the uh, bee hotel, they have several different sizes of holes for bees to nest in. So we wanna make sure we're using untreated wood. Um, bamboo is also a really good plant or, or object to use to provide nesting material. And again, using plants such as Joe Pye weed that's gonna have those pithy stems is a really good way to provide nesting sites for bees. Uh, so bat nests is another really cool idea. There are 17 species of bats that are native to North Carolina, three of which that nest in the Piedmont are endangered species. Uh, the main reason for their decline is through habitat destruction and the white nose syndrome, which is actually a fungus that will disrupt their hibernation period. Um, but bats are really important in pest control. They're going to take care of really high populations of mosquitoes, cucumber beetles, and cockroaches. Cucumber beetles are actually these beetles here. They're a big crop pest, so like cucumbers and, and corn and things like that. So including bat nests, especially if you're near areas of water, like a pond or a stream where insect populations can get very high, is just another great way to cater to this other type of wildlife. And then of course we have bird baths. Um, which are great for wildlife and for birds. It's going to provide uh, an area for them to get water in the summer or to cool down in the middle of the summer. And you can see that there's several different kinds. We have these nice decorative bird baths, or you can get nice simple ones to just add to the side of your deck or balcony. And I guarantee birds are going to stop by and splash around in them. It's a great thing to include in your garden that's not plants. So now I'm going to talk about a few garden examples. Uh, here we have a picture of a demonstration garden by Debbie Roos in Pittsburgh, North Carolina. It just shows some really great diversity of plants and it includes purple coneflower, which we didn't get to talk about today, but another really good plant for the Piedmont. Uh, it's got this nice diversity and it's in the middle of a perennial bed. We have this nice structure here. And I thought that that was a really good idea because in the winter, a lot of these perennials are going to go dormant and that will leave bare soil. Some will keep their structure, like several grasses will keep their structure throughout the winter. Um, but including little garden pieces like this will help keep winter interest in your perennial beds just throughout those colder months. Here's another image of a very diverse garden. Got a little blue stem here and several other plants that create a nice diverse wildlife habitat. This is at Sarah P. Duke Gardens, which is um, in Durham. So this is, these are just two really great examples. You probably can't visit them right now, but I definitely encourage you to visit them again uh, when we can again. Uh, here's another perennial garden image that really stood out to me. You can see that they've severely reduced their turf grass, leaving just a little patch here perhaps for walking through, but then they widened their perennial bed tremendously, allowing for a nice diversity of plants that are gonna cater to a diversity of pollinators. This is an article, a farewell to lawns that I've seen in a few different places. I believe it was put out by the National Wildlife Federation. Um, and it's a, just an article talking about how turf grass lawns are very environmentally unsustainable. So we want to try and move away from turf grass and change the norm from turf grass to a more wildlife friendly and sustainable habitat. So you can see that they've had turf grass here at the bottom of their yard and then it begins to intermingle into a diverse perennial bed. See in the background their neighbor has done the same thing where they've included, included this patch of perennial plants and I thought that that really stood out to me because it's creating this nice corridor so that for pollinators, they don't have to travel so far before they reach another patch of resources. And so this is really what we ultimately want to do to help increase pollinator populations. So I wanna talk about uh, how to make these changes because it can be very daunting to say, I'm gonna rip up my turf grass and increase my perennial beds. And I encourage you to just Take a while to brainstorm what changes you want to make. It's really good to draw a visual design of your yard and say, I wanna do like a 
a, a perennial bed over here or some shrubs over here and drawing some simple guidelines to help get your thoughts and ideas onto paper. Uh, the next thing you want to do is you want to research plants. It's really important, this is, can be a very tedious task, but you want to check and see what's available near you. Check your nurseries, see what's available, and then do research on those plants that you want. Uh, make sure that you're buying them, planting them in the correct seasons. It can be very tedious to, to look that up, but it's going to help in the long run, both financially and just time-wise because you don't want to spend and invest in these plants, plant them in the wrong time, and then they end up not doing well. And feel free to reach out to me or Tara. We'd love to help you figure out what seasons are best to plant in. Um, for example, trees are best planted in early March or in late fall. So, and if they plant, or if you plant them in the middle of July, they're going to get overheated and they're not, they will likely not survive. So be patient with this part. In the end, it's going to help your invest investment, both time-wise and financially, uh, make a really good garden. I also encourage you to start with small changes. Maybe increase your perennial bed by a foot, or maybe as things die, replace them with something native. This is going to help make that daunting task more manageable, and it'll help you be able to plan better and plant plants that you really want. I encourage you also to involve your neighbors, your family, and your friends. Uh, the whole idea is to help increase awareness of the pollinators. And we have, thankfully, 10,000 certified wildlife habitats, which are helping create these nice habitat corridors, which are supporting our populations and helping with a native pollinator garden rebound. I also encourage you to use signage to help educate your neighbors and your family and your friends. Here are two signs that are available on our website. The first is through uh, the North Carolina Wildlife Federation, which is the Butterfly Highway Program. It's a statewide conservation initiative that's helping to create more pollinator gardens to help support those dependent wildlife on native flowering plants. We also have, this is the National Wildlife Federation that does the Certified Wildlife Habitat. And you can find that application online on our website as well. And you basically fill out the application and you tell us what does your yard provide for wildlife? Is it food? Is it shelter? Is it water? Places to raise young? Do you use sustainable practices? And once you fill out that application, then you can buy the sign as well. So we have this butterfly highway sign that's $35 and then the certified wildlife habitat sign is 30. Once you buy it, we'll send it to you. And then the next thing you need are just two screws and a post and you can quickly add it into your pollinator garden and help educate those who are passing by. If you need plants, here is a list of some native plant uh, nurseries uh, along with the county that they're in. Uh, I hope that you'll check them out. They, are really great. We've used a few of them and they provide really quality plants. If you would like to join a North Carolina wildlife chapter in the Piedmont, we have several. Uh, we have several chapters that are in like Gaston and Mecklenburg County, Cabarrus County, Union County, Wake County, lots of different ones throughout the Piedmont. So we encourage you to get involved. And if you have any questions about getting involved, or if there's not one in your area and you want to start one in your area, feel free to reach out to me and Tara. We would love to help you get involved or to help you start a chapter. Here's our contact information. Mine is on the left, Tara's is on the right. And then we also have the website here, which is ncwf.org. If you are interested in purchasing a sign or checking out the chapters or even making a donation to the North Carolina Wildlife Federation, uh, here's our website. Feel free to go there and, and to look those up. Uh, but other than that, thank you for joining my presentation. I would love to hear if you have any other questions. Uh, but if not, I hope you have a wonderful day and that you stay safe. So thank you so much for um, doing this. And um, anyone that does have any questions, we will hang out on the line for the next five minutes. So um, you can definitely type in the chat box and ask us any questions. Or um, you can also send us an um, email after if you come up with more questions afterwards. It was so great to have you all on the call. Thank you so much. I hope you learned a lot.
I have a question about Virginia creeper. I guess I didn't realize it was such a good plant. I do know that it oftentimes gets mixed up with poison ivy, not only in sight, but also they oftentimes grow together. My question is, um, I know English ivy is not good for a tree and obviously poison ivy is not. Uh, is it a symbiotic? Is it, will the, will the Virginia creeper kill the tree? Talk to us a little bit more about it crawling on a tree. Yeah, yeah. So it's not going to kill the tree. Um, with the English ivy, it has aerial roots that really bore into the tree and that can damage a tree. But with Virginia creeper, at least to my knowledge, it's not going to damage the tree because it adheres uh, in a much safer way and less damaging way. I don't think that it's uh, like a parasitic plant. It's not going to suck away any nutrients from the trees. Um, I, that's all I can share about it. Uh, I, if I find anything else, I'll uh, email you and let you know. But from my understanding, it is not a dangerous tree to pair with, um, or a dangerous vine to pair with trees. Thank you, that was very helpful. Um, we had a question asking if we can put up the slide with the native plant sources by county. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Great. Yeah. And I, I think someone just wanted to view this again. Um, I have been putting in the chat for anyone who is on the phone and can't see the chat. We will send over these slides afterwards too. So as soon as we're done with the call here, um, we'll be sending this over so you guys can view all the details. Um, can you talk briefly about how to add compost to clay soil? That's a question we got, Madison. Yeah, yeah. So um, what I've seen in my research is that if you have really dense clay soil, it's um, often good to add one to three inches of compost to your soil. And what you'll do is you'll just uh, get some compost, lay it out on the garden bed, the area that you want to convert to a garden, and then of course, remove any turf grass before you add it on. And then you want to take a shovel and just shovel deep, uh, stir up that soil and mix the clay with the compost. Perfect. All right, well, if anyone else um, doesn't have any more questions, we will conclude this call. Thank you so much, everyone, again, for joining. I hope you all stay safe and get some time outside, um, even if it's just in your backyards. And please do send us any emails if you have any ideas for other webinars you'd like to see, if you have questions about gardening, if you'd like to join a chapter. Um, and we will talk to you all soon. Thank you, Madison, for doing this. And thank you all for joining.